situation on the ground is catastrophic. We have a reality now where, according to the IPC, the major international bellwether for famines, this is a famine uh, that is unprecedented in modern world history. You have 1.1 million people facing imminent risk of famine. You already have 31 people, including 27 kids, according to the Gaza Health Ministry, that have died due to malnutrition uh, and dehydration. You have a reality today where in northern Gaza in particular, you have people facing catastrophic food insecurity. All people in Gaza are facing food insecurity. We've seen really stark warnings issued by humanitarians, people, kids forced to eat leaves and eat forage for the leftovers of what's eaten by rats to survive. Rafah is the backbone of the humanitarian operation, which is, of course, quite limited as we speak. Um, and a ground invasion would be unlawful and catastrophic because there is no safe place to go in Gaza. There are nearly 1.5 million people in Gaza, more than a million of whom have been displaced many multiple times over. Um, Gaza is um, not only being starved, but is being destroyed. And uh, Rafah really, um, you know, would create significant harm to a civilian population already facing unimaginable catastrophic situation. Omar, this week we saw the UN Security Council voting for a ceasefire, um, clearly that arising only as a result of the US decision to abstain. I've spoken with senior Israeli, former Israeli officials this week who uh, tell me that this is a turning point in this war, but of course only if we see compliance. What powers does the Security Council have to enforce uh, that ceasefire and to ensure that there is compliance on that agreement? Look, I think the uh, Security Council vote was long overdue, but it's important. It's critical now that all parties comply with its uh, with with the resolution. The United States suggestion that it is not binding is simply not accurate. Uh, Article 25 of the UN Charter uh, makes clear, um, you know, uh, that that provisions of the resolutions like this and the language is very clear. Immediately demands uh, the ceasefire call um, is binding. Many of the aspects of the resolution already are legally binding such as the call to immediately release hostages or for aid to be allowed in. Uh, the United States suggestion otherwise lessens the chance that the parties will carry it out. Ultimately, um, you know, the fact that this is binding doesn't obviously mean immediately that the UN will dispatch an army to enforce it. But really, it's up to states. And Human Rights Watch has been clear that whether it's the International Court of Justice's binding order that Israel is not complying with or this resolution that already Israel and Hamas are not complying with, it's up to states to use all forms of their leverage, including imposing an arms embargo on Israel, including targeted sanctions on Israel in order to press Israel to comply with this resolution. So obviously, the Security Council can't take enforcement action. That's unlikely to happen under uh, Article 7. So ultimately, it's really up to states to use their leverage here. The state with the most amount of leverage is, of course, the United States, Israel's strongest ally and partner in the region. You mentioned the prospect that we could see sanctions and an arms embargo if Israel goes ahead with that rougher incursion. Let's talk realistically, though. How likely is that to happen? I think we have an unprecedented moment where this is a, a topic that's really on the table. Kamala Harris, the vice president, you know, would not rule out any options uh, in an interview she gave several days ago. You have Democratic lawmakers, including in the U.S. Senate, that have been very clear that Israel is not complying with a new national security memo set by the White House, which requires all recipients of U.S. aid to pledge to comply with um, international and U.S. law, uh, Human Rights Watch, Oxfam, but also numerous uh, Democratic senators have said th that Israel is not complying with this very measure. Um, I think a Rafah invasion, as the United States has said, as President Biden has said, is a red line. Uh, it, you know, in reality, many red lines have already been crossed. Uh, but I think you can see public opinion and state policies are changing. You have, um, you know, in the International Court of Justice, the international, the very institutions of uh, the international community, many of which grew out of the ashes of World War II, um, which are being actively undermined. And I think the risk here, if Israel continues down this path, 
And it's not only if it goes into Rafah, but if starvation continues, if unlawful attacks continue, if the atrocities continue, is undermining the very institutions charged with protecting international law and civilian protection. The ramifications for such action will be felt far beyond Israel-Palestine. So I think we really have a test of the rules-based international order, and that's why I think Israel should take these warnings seriously. Omar, just before I let you go, this is a question I've asked, I think, every guest that we've had on this week discussing this issue. Um, what should we be watching next and what is the most critical issue to your mind right now when it comes to Israel's war against Hamas in Gaza? Uh, we are going to see these talks get back underway. The uh, Israelis have requested uh, more negotiations to take place, having previously pushed back on that idea um, with the United States. If we see these talks going ahead, then then what should we be looking out for next? Look, I think we have to have all eyes on the humanitarian situation in Gaza, in particular starvation. I mean, the reality today is, I mean, these warnings that we've been issuing for weeks and months, that people are not only dying now of Israeli bombs, but because of starvation. Every expert that's looked at this, including epidemiologists and others, have warned. And we're talking about six months of a population being deprived of food, of clean water. These have effects, and we're already seeing thousands of cases of infectious disease, very stark warnings about the a potential skyrocketing in the number of deaths due to lack of food and water. Remember, hospitals have been under assault by the Israeli government, so even their ability to provide basic health. These are um, Gaza, I mean, we've been saying this for a long time, but really we're starting to see those warnings result in death due to starvation, lack of clean water, a lack of functioning hospitals. The population has, you know, we're already also seeing people die because of drops of aid, you know, that are, you know, we, we had a report earlier this week falling in the ocean where 12 people were killed. So the situation, I don't think the people can take very much more. They really immediately need to be action taken by the international community. And so I think that's really what we need to look to in the days ahead. Um, you know, we're really at, at, at I think, a, a catastrophic point in Gaza where potentially deaths due to starvation, lack of health and water could uh, exceed those by bombs. Omar, just super quickly, the Israelis, of course, question the credibility of HRW. They say the organization is biased. How are you responding to that criticism? Look, I mean, the Israeli government has said that about every major international institution, the UN. They've said that about the World Health Organization. They've said that about the UNICEF. They've said it about Human Rights Watch. Look, we work in 100 countries around the world, uh, and virtually every country that we've worked on say the same thing. I've been kicked out of several countries, uh, including countries like Syria and the region. So we're, we're very used to people attacking the messenger as opposed to dealing with the facts that we um, you know document. Uh, and so I think ultimately, let's not let that distract us here from the really grave abuses that we're talking about that have been called out by many others.